Good morning, everyone. We are so happy to welcome you on this beautiful day in Chicago. My name is Rachel Lieberman. I am the director here at the Sea Lake Disease Center. I am so happy to welcome you today to our annual Family Education Day. We have a jam-packed day with some amazing speakers here from University of Chicago. And so I do wanna get started pretty quickly. I'm gonna give it another minute, let other people join, and then I will go over some housekeeping reminders. I wanna welcome everyone again. Um, welcome to our Family Education Day. Once again, I'm Rachel Lieberman, the director here at the Sea Lake Disease Center on behalf of myself, Bana Jabri, who is our research dir director of research and our very own Dr. Ritu Verma, who is our medical director and our chief of gastroenterology here at University of Chicago. Welcome to our Family Education Day. A few housekeeping, please look at the bottom of the screens. There is a Q&A function. You can put all of your questions for speakers there. We will have two separate Q&A sessions. We will try to address all of your questions. And if we don't, we hope to get back to you, information to you after the event. For those of you who are participating and have a child um, who will be joining our breakout session later this morning, we will prompt you at our break to join that session if you should need anything or have some technical difficulties or can't find that link please message myself or Rebecca Auburn, who is one of our um, amazing students here at University of Chicago and runs all of our social media. I can't thank her enough for all of her work for today. Um, but again, let us know if you need help with that. But I would like to kick off the morning with our medical director, Dr. Ritu Verma, who is um, here to share and open the day. And we are just so happy to have you. So Dr. Verma, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I think I made the big mistake of staying on mute. So um, thank you, Rachel. Thanks very much for the introduction. And I do wanna thank everyone, children, adults, grandparents, uncles, aunts, anyone who has joined us on our Family Education Day. Uh, welcome to the University of Chicago. Um, our annual day that we are hopefully going to have annually and maybe next year we'll actually have it in person. Uh, I think we're all kind of tired of Zoom and um, it's time to meet in person. So we do hope uh, that we'll be able to do. So I get, I see a chat that you're unable to hear me. Um, hmm. Rebecca? Are you able to? Okay, it's, it's fixed. fixed. Perfect. Thank you. And you know, these are the glitches that are going to happen. So bear with us. Um, so you know, when we talk about celiac disease, uh, the question always is, where have we been? And where are we going? And that's truly what we are going to reflect on for today. Um, all of us know those in the celiac world, whether we are providers, or we are patients, we know that a blood test needs to be done. And before the blood test, somebody needs to think about whether you should do the blood test or not. So in the past, what we had was, you know, we kind of thought that if you have belly aches, diarrhea, and so on, you should be tested for celiac disease. And you got a blood test and then went on and maybe saw a dietitian, maybe not, started a gluten-free diet and so on. And that was really the past. What we are hoping and what we are getting to as a medical community and as a community that is involved in celiac disease, so those of us who are patients, those of us who are caretakers of patients, what the future is really working on celiac disease as a disease entity just like any other, where we talk about the clinical pillar, we talk about education, we talk about research, and we talk about advocacy. So what is, where do we go with celiac disease is really working on each one of these pillars that I just mentioned. So from a clinical care standpoint, it's our job as providers, it's our job as centers to be able to educate people in the medical community that 
celiac disease is more than a GI condition. This is a condition that involves any part of your body. It's a multi-system disease, it's an autoimmune disease, and that is part of what our mission is to go forward from here and educate our, our other subspecialists like the rheumatologists, the looking at hematologists and so on. One of the big impacts that has happened this year, and we're working on that here at the University of Chicago, is looking at the neurological and the psychological impact of celiac disease. And that's something that we're looking at from a research standpoint and also educating our other medical community that people having brain fog, people having headaches, depression, learning disabilities are part of the learning part of the care, that we need to learn how to treat these children and adults. We need to learn how to actually diagnose them with celiac disease. So that is sort of our mission from an education standpoint is to educate people that celiac disease is not just a GI condition, but it's a multi-system autoimmune disorder that needs to be worked on. We have testing. So testing has always been there. We all know the TTG. Anyone who's been in the celiac community knows about the tissue transglutaminase. We are also learning that the tissue transglutaminase may not be the test that is always done for testing from a follow-up standpoint. And we will have some discussion about that later on today in terms of how good is this test. So again, from the future, we need to learn our tests a little bit better. We know that the screening tests are the tissue transglutaminase. There's also a deamidated gliadin and endomycele antibodies. These are the blood tests that are done and have been done for many, many years. But what is the significance of these tests? Again, that is the future significance of these tests from a follow-up standpoint. We are also learning that just having normal antibodies on a gluten-free diet is not enough that we do need to have more testing done and possibly have a repeat endoscopy and possibly have other therapies that Dr. Semrad will talk about later today. So testing, we know where it is. We need to know more. We need more testing, more test tools. So we all know about an endoscopy that most of us get if you have a positive celiac panel. Other tools, looking at Video capsules, again, this is research that's being looked at. Can a video capsule help? That is for the future for us to learn. And that's the research pillar that needs to be supported in terms of other tests besides an endoscopy that needs to be done, especially in the questionable kind of patients. So what else do we wanna look for in the future? We know the gluten-free diet and the, Anna, our dietitian will talk more about that. But then it's not an easy diet to follow. It's not a complete nutritional diet to follow. What else can we have besides a gluten-free diet? Dr. Semrad will help us with that. Going on to advocacy, and this is where all of us can work on it. It is so important that the medical community join in. It is so important that the patients join in and the families join in to really be our advocates. We need to be our advocates to get better labeling laws, we need to be our advocates to have insurances cover for our dietitian visits, for our psychologist visits, and also we do need to have some coverage for the expensive gluten-free foods. So again, here at the Celiac Disease Center in Chicago, we actually have, we are going to be working on some of those things. We've been working on them with our advocacy groups, the Celiac Disease Foundation, Beyond Celiac. Those are groups that people should learn to join and join in and be your own advocates, whether you are the patient or your child is the patient, whoever is dealing with celiac disease, unless the community gathers their forces together, we will not be able to move the needle. We also need to gather together and talk about clinical trials. What are the clinical trials that are out there for the adults? Again, Dr. Semrad will touch on some of that. So, Advocacy comes from us in a celiac center, but more importantly, advocacy comes in from the community. We all need to join in and say, these are our needs and we need to work on these needs and we need to move the needle among the political and other uh, arenas that are out there that are more influential in making these changes in the labeling laws. Again, 
Celiac Disease Foundation has done a tremendous effort working through getting the labeling laws through together, done a tremendous effort in terms of working with the NIH. We all need to get together and support our advocacy groups. Beyond Celiac has given a lot of grants to places and so has CDF. And I think it's important that we all really come in, talk about it, what's important for us as clinicians, what's important for us as parents, and what's important for us as children. And of course, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist and close to my heart, what we have is getting our teens into the advocacy world. And here at the University of Chicago, we have a teen group and you'll hear from a couple of them later on today on how they've joined forces and talking about how they are going to own their disease and how they are going to be the future for celiac disease and they are going to make that roadmap out for them. So I have a lot of wishes and hopes for the future. And I know looking at our teens that they are doing a tremendous job us as parents, us as clinicians need to join in. So I wanna welcome everyone to today's day. Hopefully they will be fun. Hopefully there will be some learnings and a lot of questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A and we hope to answer some of them as we go along through the course of the day. So at this time, what I am going to do is introduce our dietitian. Anna Velasquez is our dietitian here at the Celiac Disease Center in the University of Chicago. Uh, she's been here with us for a very short time, but really has made a huge impact. And today she is going to teach all of us about the gluten-free diet, different vitamins and supplements. So Anna, please take it away. Hello everyone. Um, it's such a joy to be here with you today. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so during our talk today, we do have quite a lot to cover. Um, my hopes for today would be to really cover the gluten-free diet basics, um, touch on the significance of lactose intolerance, um, review some of the um, labeling laws and current certifications out there, um, but we'll also want to discuss considerations with cross-contact and balancing the gluten-free diet, um, and then all the different nutrients that we really track over time. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some of the um, common challenges that our patients face and reason why follow-up is so, so important. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, so we all know that the gluten-free diet really revolves around gluten, um, but what really is gluten? Um, so gluten is a protein that we find in wheat, barley, and rye, but really more specifically, um, gluten is actually an umbrella term. Um, so it's an umbrella term for distinct proteins um, in each of these grains. Um, so for wheat, they are gliadins and glutenins. Um, for rye, it is seclin, and for barley, it's hordine. Um, but what all these proteins really have in common is that they all have this little um, protein fraction called gliadin. Um, and this is the part of gluten that really um, is recognized by the immune system um, and then results in that negative reaction in celiac disease. Um, so why does gluten exist? Um, why is it even out there? Um, so during the baking process, um, gluten traps air bubbles um, from fermentation, and then allows the bread to really um, expand. Um, and so in that, it makes it really airy and chewy. Um, and then another function of it is um, it does give it firmness and structure. So as you can see in this picture, um, it kind of depicts all of those characteristics where it has the, um, the structure of it on the outside, but it's really like chewy and airy on the inside. Okay. So when someone is diagnosed with celiac disease, um, they do need to start a gluten-free diet, um, which is currently the only treatment for celiac disease. Um, the gluten protein um, is, is recognized by the immune system as like a foreign invader. And so our immune system kind of wants to um, take control of it. Um, and although the immune system means well, um, what actually happens is um, the damage of the lining to the intestines, resulting in all those different symptoms, um, variety of symptoms for different people. Um, and so starting when someone first starts the gluten-free diet, um, 
the first and foremost thing that they need to do is to eliminate um, those grains that do contain um, gluten. Um, but then taking it a step, step further, um, they really do need to avoid all foods derived from those grains um, and foods that use those grains as ingredients in like other foods. Um, so it also means that the gluten-free um, food should be prepared in such a way um, that it does not um, touch other foods that do have gluten in them um, and it does not come in contact with like tools or utensils um, that may have gluten on them or have come in contact. Um, so this also the diet also includes um, gluten-free oats um, and so when we're talking about cross contact, this is kind of where our recommendation for gluten free oats comes in, um, because oats may come into contact with gluten containing grains um, through transport, harvest, growing the whole process before it gets to us. Um, and so that's what really gives the rise to our recommendations. Um, but then on oats and prevention of cross contact, we'll dive into um, that deeper later on. Okay, so in talking about grains, um, there are, of course, some grains of concern on the gluten-free diet. Um, and so it's important to know that wheat, barley, and rye um, might be known by other names. So this is helpful um, to see when you're really navigating the grocery store or just reading a menu. And some of these words might come up. Um, you might um, so this slide lists some of um, the other common names for gluten. Um, and so the top four are the wheat, wheat bran, um, wheat starch, wheat germ, which are more obvious because they actually have the word wheat in them. Uh, but the other ones might not be as obvious. Um, so the other names for wheat would be something like durum, which is just a type of wheat. Um, it's used to make semolina um, and couscous, so mostly like in pasta making. Um, bulgur is a wheat that is cleaned, hard boiled, and sifted into small pieces. Um, it's best known for its role in the Middle Eastern salad tabbouleh. Um, and then we have spelt, um, inkhorn, emmer, kamut. Um, those are all ancient wheat um, grains. And then the gram flour um, is just flour, but it's um, sifted more um, coarsely than wheat flour. Um, and then farro is known for its like nutty flavor. Um, and then trictocali is a hybrid between um, wheat and rye. And then rye and barley, really our star grains, um, you know, eliminated on the gluten-free diet um, are cereal plants um, and they are grown for different reasons, sometimes just to like fertilize the soil and make it um, like more nutritious. Sometimes it's just for like livestock purposes to feed animals. Okay, so this whole discussion really brings us to, um, to oats. Um, and so in the past, oats were really clumped um, together with, with wheat, barley, and rye as grains to avoid. However, studies do show us that um, a modest ingestion of oats can be tolerated by most people with celiac disease. Um, and they often do not result in that same immune reaction. Um, that is not safe. Um, but for those who cannot tolerate oats, because that's always um, a possibility, it's because of um, a protein that is found in oats called avenin. Um, and so this protein is, um, has a very similar function to gluten. And so it can sometimes be recognized um, in the same way as gluten. Um, so if you are able to tolerate oats though, um, and you, so meaning your body does not have that immune reaction to them, um, there are still things that we need to consider before consumption. Um, and so, those things would be things like um, where the oats are um, grown, harvested, transported, and stored. Um, we want to uh, make sure that they are gluten-free and do not come into contact with other grains. Um, and so there are two ways really to make sure that the oats are gluten-free. Um, the preferred way is the purity protocol. Um, and so this is just, uh, it consists of different steps that the manufacturer takes to make sure to minimize risk, um, risk of cross contact throughout the whole process. 
Um, the other way is mechanical sorting, um, which really occurs after the oats have already arrived at the processing facility. Um, and so it's a machine um, that kind of um, goes through it and sorts them out by shape to eliminate any gluten containing grains. Um, now, when these oats arrive at these facilities, usually the processors do have um, certain standards. So they wouldn't accept oats that tested um, above a certain um, parts per million um, because they are meant and destined to be gluten-free. Um, but however, you know, with mechanical sorting, um, it is something that's debatable, to, you know, whether it can actually clean the oats. Um, and so our recommendations are that um, we want to make sure that the oats are labeled gluten-free versus um, via the purity protocol or um, certified gluten-free by like a third party um, certification. Okay, um, so outside of grains, there are also some other um, hidden sources <laughs> that we need to consider um, and briefly touch on. So some of them are things like soups, broths, um, gravies that may have wheat as an ingredient as like a thickener in them. Um, but then miso, salt, some teas, um, and even like juices may have um, barley in them. So like an example of that would be the brand Naked um, has only one juice. It's called Green Machine. And this Green Machine lists um, barley grass as an ingredient. Um, so it's really something to kind of um, like always having to look at the labels to make sure that those grains are not included. Um, we also want to be careful with things like brewer's yeast, which is a byproduct from um, beer brewing and includes malt. Um, and then things like gluten removed beer, um, where it poses a risk because there's an enzyme that is used to break down that gluten. Um, but because it breaks it down into tiny pieces and it may not be removed completely, then we run into trouble with like protein analysis tests that cannot pick up any fragments maybe left behind. Um, and then lastly, there are things like non-food items such as Play-Doh, supplements, um, medications that will also need to be reviewed. Okay, so in talking um, about all the foods on the gluten-free diet that we need to exclude, we don't wanna forget um, about all the naturally gluten-free foods out there um, because actually most of the food groups um, are safe to eat on the gluten-free diet. Um, so they would be things like poultry, seafood, fruits, vegetables, um, seeds, variety of different gluten-free grains um, such as rice, quinoa, millet, buckwheat, sorghum, and so much more. Um, and so with this list, um, there is a whole other list, which includes ingredients such as MSGs or vinegar, not malt vinegar, all the other vinegars, um, and food starches that may be um, ringing an alarm, but they're actually safe and gluten-free. Okay, so before we shift um, kind of into the labeling laws um, and nutrition portion of the gluten-free diet, I did want to address lactose intolerance um, because it is common prior to and even after diagnosis with celiac disease. Um, so lactose is a type of sugar in milk um, and it is uh, broken into smaller sugars um, by an enzyme called lactase. Um, and this enzyme is actually located in the brush border of the small intestine. Um, and so because of celiac disease and the damage that occurs along the lining, um, the intestine actually stops the production of this enzyme. Um, and then without, people can't really digest the sugar lactose. Um, and then because they cannot digest the sugar, it results in symptoms most commonly like bloating, cramping, or diarrhea. Um, so for some people to alleviate these symptoms, we do start the gluten-free diet together with a lactose-free diet. Um, however, over time, most people are able to reintroduce lactose um, as the lining of the intestine heals and is able to um, produce that enzyme again. Okay, um, so labeling laws. These are so important for us to um, consider because they really do guide our, um, our choices in the foods we choose. Um, and it's important to understand where they're coming from. 
So the labeling laws first, um, we have the FDA's um, gluten-free food labeling rule of 2013. Um, and so this rule really allows companies to use the statement gluten-free. Um, but in doing so, they do claim that their food is less than 20 parts per million. Um, and this rule is voluntary though, so companies don't have to use it. Um, even if the food is naturally gluten-free, like frozen peas, they don't have to be labeled gluten-free. Um, it is also important to say that um, the law does not require the companies to test the product to see if it actually meets the criteria. Um, so the FDA covers most of um, like packaged foods, um, vitamins and supplements um, that have already entered the market. Um, and then the USDA, um, what it doesn't cover is um, alcohol, medications, cosmetics, and like all the USDA foods, um, which would be things like um, poultry, eggs, all the meats, um, dairy products, eggs, um, and then like marinated meats and anything that contains a certain percentage of like an animal product. Um, so broths and soups also fall into that category. Um, the other law that we have is the Food Allergen Labeling Law and Consumer Protection Act. So this one covers the top eight allergens um, and companies um, are required to disclose any of the top eight allergens through like a bolded statement at the bottom um, of the ingredient list. Um, and so because of that, um, if there is wheat, because wheat is a, um, one of the top eight allergens, um, if there is wheat in the ingredients, it will state in bolded letters contains wheat. Um, but unfortunately, this law does not cover um, rye and barley. So if the statement is present, um, but it does not say wheat or it's not present at all, we still have to go and read through the whole label. Okay, so this is something really exciting on the horizon since our last education day. Um, in August of 2021, a new bill was proposed in Congress um, called the Food Labeling Modernization Act. Um, and so this act would really enhance our current laws in place um, in terms of like adding new allergens to be considered and having to be disclosed but also, and most importantly for us, um, disclosing all gluten containing ingredients. So this would include rye and barley. Um, so this graphic here clearly explains and shows um, what the law is now. Um, and then on the right side, you see how it would be um, enhanced. So as of now, this law has just been introduced. Um, and so it is something if it is something that you are really passionate about and going along the lines of what Dr. Verma was previously saying about advocacy, um, please reach out to your representatives um, and senators for support um, before it gets voted on. Okay, so along the labeling laws, um, we do have some gluten free product certifications. So they're like third party um, that come in and help the companies out in the certification process. Um, so a company may choose to have their gluten free food certified by a company who meets the FDA's gluten free labeling law. Um, so that's like the first and foremost requirement. Um, but very often, um, the they the company the third party companies have their own criteria on top of the gluten free labeling law. Um, so listed here are just some common certification with the gluten free certification organization probably being the most recognizable out on the market. Um, and then, as I mentioned, all of their have all of them have kind of like their additional criteria. Um, so the FDA law, law says um, it needs to be less than 20 parts per million, and some of them really sometimes go even below that to like 10 and 5. Um, and then the recertification process, it's not something that you kind of just get and you're done with it. You do have to recertify. And so each of these companies kind of has their own rules on it, but very often it's a yearly thing. The products have to be retested. Um, and then there's like plant inspections that go along with it as well. Okay, so when we talk about the FDA law and then all these certifications, they really do revolve the 
around the parts per million. Um, but wh what is parts per million? Um, it's such a difficult concept to really grasp because one of the most important things to consider with this is that it is not an amount of food. Um, it is really a concentration. So we can think about it more like 0.002% of a product. Um, and so ultimately the size of the product doesn't matter as long as the ratio remains below that percentage. Um, but that, with that being said, um, we also have thresholds for gluten consumption. So uh, the most frequently cited research um, for this is a research um, that took place in Italy and looked at how much gluten can people with celiac disease tolerate. Um, and so we did find that 50 milligrams of um, gluten was found to be harmful. And so 10 milligrams is usually um, used as like a threshold for the maximum amount, this time amount of gluten um, that you can have um, throughout the day. And so um, different foods have different varying de degrees of um, parts per million. So all of our gluten-free foods are going to have a very, very low amount of parts per million. Um, and so in order, you know, for you to meet that 10 milligrams of gluten um, per day from just gluten-free foods. Um, an example would be like, you'd have to eat 20 slices of gluten-free bread to get anywhere close um, to meeting that. So as long as you are keeping your gluten-free diet, um, you are really um, falling below that 10 milligrams. Okay, um, so cross contact, um, very big topic in the celiac disease world. Um, we know that cross contact can result from um, symptoms, can result in symptoms, and then severity really depending on individual sensitivity. Um, and so it may also contribute to intestinal damage and trigger the autoimmune reaction, especially if it is something that is ongoing and over time. So if cross-contact exposure um, to gluten continues, it may result in an autoimmune reaction in other parts of the body. Um, so ultimately, the reason why we follow the gluten-free diet and prevent cross-contact is to help the intestine heal and absorb nutrition again, um, but also to prevent another autoimmune reaction in the body later on. Um, Okay, so cross contact can really occur from anything that goes into your mouth or is just around your mouth. Um, so they can be food or it can be something like a chapstick that is just always on your lips. Um, it can occur during meal preparation at home, restaurants, parties, um, and then things to consider really is how the gluten free food is prepared. Um, we do recommend things like a separate toaster, um, a separate pasta strainer um, because of the little crevices, um, and then like avoiding wooden utensils that are shared between the two diets, um, regular diet and gluten-free diet, um, and then making sure like that the fryer is only used for gluten-free frying, that it's not used to make gluten-free fries and then um, used to make chicken tenders coated in wheat flour. Um, and so other things to consider would be things like grills and ovens, making sure that there's a barrier uh, between the racks and then the gluten-free food you're making. Okay, so balancing the gluten-free diet. We have now reviewed the diet. Um, we reviewed the laws and the cross contact and we're ready to kind of start our gluten-free journey. So now what? Um, now we make sure that the gluten-free diet um, you are eating is balanced and that it includes everything your body um, needs to heal and then thrive. Um, so this graphic, um, this is my plate. Um, it's a representation of the dietary recommendations for Americans from the USDA. Um, it ultimately splits the plate into four sections. Um, so as you can see, um, fruits and veggies are making up about half of the plate and then protein and the grains make up the other like half of the plate. There's also like a side plate um, that I that I guess is present here and that's for dairy, um, but really it's just representing our um, sources of um, calcium. 
The protein portion here can come from lean meat, poultry, or fish, but plant-based sources also count, so they will be things like um, beans and nuts. Um, fruits and veggies can come in any form, fresh, frozen, canned, all are great. Um, and then the main group here that is really being removed um, and substituted is the grain group. Um, so we are taking out whole wheat, pastas, rye, barley, and inserting rice, potato, corn, quinoa, and all the other gluten-free grains that we talked about. Um, so the goal here is to aim um, for whole grains and then limit refined grains. And just as a side note, um, a refined grain is one that has been um, stripped of its germ and bran. Um, so those are the parts that really harbor the fiber um, and the minerals and vitamins. Um, so what we often see in clinic is, um, you know, people want to really secure gluten-free foods in their household right after starting the gluten-free diet. Um, and because there are so many cool gluten-free snacks and products out there these days, um, they patients tend to shift towards those things, kind of forgetting about the gluten-free um, grains that are available. Um, and so what we really are aiming to do here is to balance the diet in a way that it includes those gluten-free grains because they will be whole and include that fiber, those minerals and vitamins, um, and then you know rely on the gluten-free snacks um, and other packaged foods in between. Um, so just balancing it out. Okay. So um, moving on to the nutrients of concern. Um, what we have here is a simplified graphic of the GI tract. Um, we know that celiac disease affects the small intestine, um, causing bilis atrophy or like flattening of those finger-like projections. Um, so I thought this would be a good visual to kind of um, look at all the nutrients that are affected by the damage. Um, so the small intestine includes the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Um, and as you can see here, most of the nutrition is absorbed right around um, that part. So these are there are certain nutrients here um, that we do take care to monitor over time, um, be just because of the complications that can arise um, if there is a deficiency of them in the body. So some listed here um, are iron, zinc, calcium, um, the B vitamins um, as well. Okay, so then this chart really um, better organizes the whole thing. Um, and it goes through, you know, all the symptoms um, or diagnosis. So we do monitor vitamin D um, and calcium intake from the diet to make sure that children have enough for their growing bones and adults maintain their reserves um, to prevent conditions such as osteoporosis. Um, iron deficiency anemia um, and associated symptoms of like fatigue um, is something that may be present at diagnosis or even arise later after initiating the gluten-free diet. Um, so either it's because the body is not absorbing enough iron um, or the gluten-free diet is um, not including a lot of iron in, in the foods in the diet. Um, so lack of vitamin B12 um, and folate can also contribute to other types of anemias. And as a result, um, they result in like um, neurological symptoms, um, more so in um, adults than children. Um, and those would be things like loss of balance or numbness. Um, zinc is another mineral that we do um, really look at and most importantly in children because it is, um, it's really important for growth um, and immune responses and other enzymatic reactions in the body. Okay, so with nutrition being such a big part of um, the gluten-free diet, um, there are also other challenges that can arise from following um, the gluten-free diet um, as a treatment for celiac disease. So these include initial ingestment and mourning um, of gluten. Um, and so some people, when they are first diagnosed with celiac disease, they're happy, they're relieved that they finally have an answer um, to all their symptoms, um, but some people really, really feel the loss um, of gluten. Um, and so having resources from support groups to celiac centers to just reliable tools um, like Find Me Gluten app um, or imp are important to really start, um, you know, coming back um, 
and like experimenting and trying out new things. Um, so restaurants and eating out um, kind of leads into it. Um, this is another part that um, a lot of patients struggle with um, because first you have to really um, get a hang of the gluten-free diet, um, learn how to make the gluten-free food at home by yourself without cross contact, but then you run into having to trust someone else to make the food for you. Um, so those are the type of resources, again, with um, the apps and our centers to kind of um, help offer resources for that. Um, and start slowly bringing restaurants and eating out into the diet uh, because it is an important social aspect um, of life. Um, and then traveling. Um, so traveling is also important and a big portion. Um, a lot of people, when they travel, they feel like they, you know, they'd have to pack suitcases of foods with them. And so it does become a burden and something that every family is different and we need to consider and kind of talk through to see what the best strategy is. Um, and then school is you know, a place where kids spend so much of their time during the week. Um, and so it really worries parents to have their kids in school where there's so many opportunities for cross contact. Um, and so creating a safe environment in those places is important too. And it's actually something we're going to be talking about in just a little bit later on today. Okay. And so lastly, just wanted to go over the importance of follow-up. Um, so with all the nutrients and all the other challenges in mind, I want to express how important it is um, to follow up for many reasons. So first, we want to monitor the antibodies related to celiac disease as they um, do really help us see if the gluten-free diet is working um, and kind of track the healing process. Um, as the gluten-free diet is started, there may be uh, new or ongoing symptoms and so these symptoms may be related to, um, you know, starting the gluten-free diet, like it may be lacking fiber and it's resulting in constipation, but it may also just be completely um, different symptoms that are not related to celiac disease and related to an underlying condition other than celiac that may need to be further investigated. Um, and so, um, or it may be new symptoms um, arising because of a nutrient deficiency. So those are all things that we kind of um, track and want to make sure are um, being talked about. And then labs can also help guide that discussion with nutrition and especially supplementation um, because doing nutrition labs um, will guide us in, you know, prescribing a very specific amount of a nutrient or a multivitamin. And then celiac disease um, is really different in different stages of life. Um, it will look different in childhood. Um, there's gonna be different consideration in adolescence and different considerations in adulthood. Um, so this is where um, we come in and can help, um, you know, attack any of those challenges. Um, so we are here to address any of it that comes up. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, wonderful talk. Uh, and as everyone can uh, really appreciate that this is not an easy topic to cover in 20 minutes or 25 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions and answers. Um, just wanted you know everyone to know that this is a flavor. Uh, we do have events uh, almost every month, every other month with the family network events where we discuss some of these things more in depth and we will send information about that to everyone, every participant will send that through so you'll have that information. Uh, those folks who have questions about the slides and um, the recording, it'll be once the uh, session is over, you will get, once the day is over, you will get a link um, in the next few days where you can actually um, a, get a copy of these slides and also the talks. Um, so it is indeed my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Carol Semrad, who is a professor here in, in medicine at the University of Chicago. Um, she is an integral part of the Celiac Center. And not only is she part of the Celiac Center, but she's also the director of the Small Bowel Disease and Nutrition Group in the Department of Medicine for GI, and a director of the clinical research um, in the section of medicine as well. So lots of hats, lots of hats, but for us, 
The most important hat is really being part of the Celiac Center and has done some wonderful work uh, in the adult world, but also sort of bridging between adults and pediatrics and seeing some of our um, um, older children, I will call them, or young adults as Dr. Semrad would call. So Dr. Semrad, the floor is yours. My sharing here. Do you see my? Not yet. Oh, oh! I knew that was going to happen. Uh, no worries. Okay, share. There we go. It's working. Okay, here I am. Okay. No how many times I do this, <laughs> I get it, it wrong. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Here we go. Let me just move this bar over. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about uh, probably uh, the most exciting area of celiac disease, which is new therapies and what's on the horizon. So why is celiac disease ideal for therapy and cure? First of all, it's very common. And when you have a common disease, a lot of scientists and industry wants to get involved. There's a high association with genes, the HLA, DQ2, and A genes. And so we know the genetic uh, risk factors, and we know the trigger. That's the most important part that unlike other autoimmune diseases, we know that gluten is the trigger of celiac disease present in wheat, rye, and barley. And we also know a fair amount about the T cell mediated bowel inflammation that gluten triggers. And this is um, from years of great basic science by immunologists. One is Dr. Jabri, who's here at the university of Chicago. So they're unraveling how this inflammatory reaction occurs. So why do we need therapy other than the gluten-free diet and celiac disease? So to start, the gluten-free diet is very a very effective treatment, but there's people who have variable sensitivity. Some uh, can eat some gluten. I don't, we don't recommend it, but when they do, they don't get sick. Others get extremely sick when they even eat trace amounts of gluten. The gluten contaminations occur ubiquitously because gluten is everywhere in processed food. And then there's the incomplete response to a gluten-free diet, particularly in the adult world. Um, adults have persistent symptoms in up to 30%, not always related to bowel inflammation. They have persistent bowel inflammation in four, anywhere from four to 60%. So the 4% is in Finland where they have um, very good social structure to uh, provide the gluten-free diet and um, very good adherence to the diet. And then there's refractory celiac disease, which is rare. So rarely are, are celiacs going to get into a trouble where they no longer respond and have a high uh, risk for developing a lymphoma. Then there's quality of life and cost. In order to actually design or think about treatments, the most important part here is that we have to understand how gluten causes inflammation. And this cartoon brings out the important steps. So the first step is that we don't have enzymes to fully digest gluten into small, small little amino acids that are never uh, immunogenic. So we have these small glidin peptides that then can get across the lining of the epithelium and be, uh, be acted on by this enzyme called tissue transglutaminase that is either underneath the lining or maybe shed into actually the lumen and can already start turning these peptides um, more charged and toxic than the original glidin peptide. And then once in the underneath the epithelial lining, there's antigen presenting cells and those cells that contain the HLA, DQ2, and 8 molecules are positively charged and are very have a very high affinity for these negatively charged peptides, which then signals the T cell to come and recognize it and start having a specific response to that antigen 
and that leads to the release of inter gamma interferon and in particular in celiac disease interleukin 15 that gives the kind of damage on the right. And here you can see that there's many, many, too many blue cells. Those are all inflammatory cells. There's no villi, it's flat. And it has these big crypts trying to regenerate that lining. So it has the potential to regenerate itself, but you have to get rid of the antigen that's triggering that inflammation. Now, besides gluten, I just want to point out that there are other environmental risk factors that we think facilitate gluten to trigger the disease in susceptible people. And that is the best evidence is for real virus, but also other viral and bacterial or fungal infections, physiologic stress, <clears throat> and the microbiome, which I'll cover. <clears throat> so let's move on to treatment strategies. Uh, again, here's the cartoon of how gluten triggers the inflammation in bowel along with environmental factors. So the first step would be to prevent the disease from ever happening. So if we could do that, we wouldn't have celiac disease. Then there's those who already have celiac disease. How can we further treat them? We're looking at immune mediated therapies. And lastly, in those who already have celiac disease or potentially are going to go to having celiac disease, we could promote gluten tolerance. And I'm going to cover each of those next. So let's first talk about the strategies to prevent celiac disease. How, how, what do we need to know? Well, first we have to identify who is at the highest risk for developing celiac disease. And that is this list here. So first degree relatives, those who carry the homozygous HLA-DQ2 molecules, particularly in first degree family relatives, <clears throat> girls more than boys, and the serum phospholipid profile, <clears throat> excuse me, is now being looked at. There's something about the phospholipid profile in celiac children that's different than um, the other children. And then there's potential celiac disease where you have an elevated tissue transglutaminase antibody, but a normal biopsy. So these are, are high risk patients who are signaling that they're on their way towards developing full blown celiac disease or bowel inflammation. And I wanna point out that these identifications of these high risk children really came out of much uh, very important work from European, United States and Norwegian studies looking to prevent celiac disease in children, but summarized in this very nice uh, article in immunology. So once you identify who's at risk, the next step is to identify the risk factors and try to intervene on these high risk infants. So what can we intervene on? So the first step is early feeding. Uh, should we introduce gluten? How early, how much? Uh, we don't have the complete answer to that. And what about other diets like the Mediterranean diet that has anti-inflammatory pro uh, properties that prevent autoimmunity? Should we be feeding children more of a high-risk children, a Mediterranean type diet? Next, there's vaccination. I know this is not a popular and a cantankerous kind of area right now, but what about vaccination against those infections that may switch on autoimmunity? Would that be of benefit? Now, I told you before, and this work was done uh, by Dr. Jabri's lab right here at the University of Chicago, they presented very elegant data on real virus infection and strong evidence that in their celiac mouse model and in human correlate studies that early exposure to real virus somehow switches that intolerance to gluten that allows the development of celiac disease. And then there's rotavirus vaccination also looked at in children at risk for celiac disease. And, and there's reports that rotavirus vaccination actually decreases the incidence of celiac disease in at-risk children. So uh, this is a very important area for us to, to uh, try to prevent the disease. How about altering the microbiome? There is data that the microbiome in children with celiac disease is different than controls. 
It's controversial whether probiotics are beneficial in these children, but it's an area that's intensively being investigated as a possible prevention strategy. And then there's the concept of halting progression in those who present with these, they're at high risk, they have a positive antibody, but their biopsy is still normal. How can you get these children to uh, be induced into tolerating gluten again? And we're going to talk about those um, strategies in a minute. So what are the therapies under investigation for people who actually have celiac disease? This is not at risk at this point. This is people who actually have the disease. So one strategy is to try to pre-digest gluten or try to sequester it in the lumen of the intestine or stomach so that it can't even get across and trigger inflammation. And here we have oral enzyme therapies we're looking at, the so-called prolyl endopeptidases that are made in bacteria and fungus, but not in humans. So we take advantage of these other organisms that make these enzymes. And then there's oral polymers that can bind to gluten and decrease absorption. Those are being studied. We can try to block entry of the gluten peptides by using tight junction inhibitors. And we're looking at blocking the immune reaction uh, based on blocking anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies or by using these antibodies to block the um, making these peptides more into immunogenic and blocking interleukin-15, which is one of the main cytokines involved in celiac-related inflammation. Lastly, there's therapies to restore oral gluten uh, tolerance or, or to restore oral tolerance to gluten. And these are referred to as vaccines or these so-called nanoparticles. But I want to go over what's the principle here because all are going to, in some way, try to accomplish demolishing or deleting these gluten-specific CD4 uh, T cells. So here, just to start out, this is the standard celiac patient. They have the right genetic background. They are gluten peptides are coming into the diet. They bind to the antigen presenting cell, and then right away there becomes a clone of these gluten specific CD4 T cells. And these stay for life. These are memory cells. They're never going to go away. So how do you make them go away? Well, one way is to try to somehow inactivate, inactivate or delete them, wipe them out, or try to expand these other T cells called regulatory T cells, such that they inhibit these gluten-specific CD4 cells. And that would, in theory, allow people to eat gluten again, because we wouldn't recognize it as, as um, allergic or immunogenic. I'm next going to cover summary of the current clinical uh, drug studies for celiac disease. Where are we with this? So we have um, some drugs that are already in trial, and I'll give you what the results are. They're not perfect. So what about the first drug we ever looked at and put into clinical trial was called lorazetide. This is a tight junction modulator, and it's meant to decrease permeability so the gluten peptides can't get across the lining. At low doses, this drug is effective at decreasing symptoms and tissue transglutaminase levels, but we really don't know anything about whether it blocks bowel injury. In other words, will it be effective to block that inflammation? It's now in a phase three clinical trial based on the properties of blocking symptoms. And this gets into our studies and trying to determine what are our endpoints. Are our endpoints to decrease symptoms or are our endpoints to really block down that bowel inflammation so the, the intestinal villi come back to a normal size and, and no inflammation or excessive inflammation. Then the next drug out was ALV003, which is so-called latiglutinase. This is a gluten degrading oral enzyme, but in a large uh, phase two study, 
unfortunately, there was no histologic or symptom improvement. However, in looking at that study, there were some um, flaws in design in the uh, design of the trial. And so when the investigators looked at a subset of the seropositive patients, it looked like they did improve the seropositive symptomatic patients. And based on that, it's now into a further into a phase two trial. Then there's the uh, next VAX2, which is a vaccine meant to promote oral tolerance. Here, this, is, uh, this was a vaccine that had three of the immunodominant gluten peptides that sort of covered reaction to all the rest of the peptides. And it was designed for patients who have HLA-DQ2 type genotype. This vaccine in small in the phase one and two clinical trials. Number one, it was safe, but it and it did decrease the T cell response to graded introductions of the vaccine peptide. But when they gave patients the actual gluten challenge with the vaccine, there was no protection against uh, inflammation. And so this drug is um, uh, dead. I don't think it's going to have anything more. Uh, it just was a failed uh, drug. Then there's AMG714. What is this? This is an antibody IL, uh, anti IL 15 human monoclonal antibody. And in the first studies that were done in people with refractory celiac disease type 2, remember these are very, very rare individuals, but it did not decrease these aberrant T cells that can then go on and uh, form lymphoma it didn't have any effect on those T cells in blocking that. But there is a trial starting now in non-responsive celiac disease. Non-responsive means that there's partial response, but there's still bowel inflammation and symptoms. What are the promising new therapies? Well, there's a recent article out in the New England Journal of Medicine on using tissue transglutaminase 2 inhibitors to actually block inf inflammation. This is called the Z1277 drug, and it's uh, given by oral administration. And here there was some exciting results, preliminary that there was decreased gluten-induced intestinal damage, which is very important. In my view, we have to stop the intestinal damage in, and the symptoms together. I don't think it's enough just to block symptoms. We know this from inflammatory bowel disease that we really need to do both, promote recovery of the epithelium and uh, stop the symptoms. But at high, and at high dose, it may improve symptoms and quality of life scores at the higher dose range. So this drug is going to be in going into further study. Next is a, a drug called TAC-101, which is a nanoparticle designed to promote oral tolerance. So again, this was published in uh, Gastroenterology by Kelly. This was a, again, phase one and two study to look for safety and tolerance. Uh, or an, an efficacy. This is gliadin that's actually surrounded by a polyglycolic acid nanoparticles. So you surround the gliadin, a big, it's not little peptides, it's that whole gliadin, the long protein, and you encapsulate it with nanoparticles. It's administered intravenously, which is safe, and it blunted the T cell reaction to gluten. It actually promoted these regulatory T, regulatory T cells that may block those clones of activated cells in celiac disease. And it blocked gluten-induced inflammation. Didn't quite reach significance in terms of preventing villus injury after a gluten challenge, but showed some promise. So this will go into further study. At the University of Chicago here, I'd like to conclude with what we're doing here. What studies do we have here? So we do have four studies that will be going. Uh, the first is an IL-15 antibody that is going designed to block the immune response. It's IRB approved, and it's going to be performed in adults with non-responsive celiac disease, and they have to have clinical symptoms, and it's going to be thought of as an adjunct to the gluten-free diet. So it's in phase 2B to test for efficacy and safety. 
The CAN 101 uh, drug is also approved. This is a little bit more of an involved study because a phase one study means we have to first figure out if this is safe and whether it's going to be efficacious. So these patients have to be monitored very carefully in a clinical uh, study center at our hospital. Uh, the mechanism is, again, it's meant to promote tolerance. So it's a gluten peptide that's bound to a polymer that then goes to the liver and somehow um, does its magic to promote oral tolerance. Then there's two enzymes, oral enzyme studies that we're going to start up here, the LADI glutenase study. As I told you, there was a problem with the uh, design of that trial. And so they're putting it into another phase two trial multi-center, it's a crossover study, and they're looking again for efficacy and safety in adult patients. And lastly, there's another oral enzyme. These are pending our, our approval. It's again, an oral enzyme that predigests gluten. And here though, the exciting part for the pediatric world is we're actually going to test it in symptomatic adults and adolescents, not quite children, but we're getting there. And these are, uh, adolescents and children who are symptomatic on a gluten-free diet, and we're going to test this drug for safety and efficacy. This is a new oral enzyme that's going out for testing. So on that note, I'm going to conclude uh, new therapies and what's on the horizon for celiac disease. The first point is that the gluten-free diet is very effective, and it's the only treatment currently available for celiac disease. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is a very effective treatment for this disease. But the holy grail really is going to be preventing celiac disease or restoring oral tolerance. And I personally think that this is the most exciting area for a disease where we know what triggers inflammation to really work to do this. This will have implications, not just for celiac disease, but other autoimmune diseases, if we can figure out how to get, to get rid of these clones of cells that are attacking tissues in the body. Then there's the oral, uh, those who already have celiac disease, what drugs can we give as adju adjuncts to the gluten-free diet? Oral enzymes, tight junction and immune modulators, they may be of benefit, but we still have work to do on this. This is not a done deal. We need studies to really show these are gonna be effective. And then there's these new therapies, they will, they may improve, they, they certainly if you prevent or allow people to eat gluten, they will give quality of life back but these new therapies will not be cheaper than the gluten-free diet. So certainly we have to be mindful that we already have a good treatment, that anything that is an adjunct needs to really show that it helps beyond what a gluten-free diet helps. So we have to really watch this so that um, we're not just spending money and not really getting benefit from these drugs. So on that note, I'm going to end and turn it back over to Dr. Verma, who, by the way, I didn't thank you and Rachel for inviting me today. Uh, it always helps me to organize and review the literature and learn myself. So it's always a, a, a fun thing to do. Thanks, Dr. Semrad. Uh, a really, really excellent overview. And I agree with you. The more of these things we do, the more we all learn. And uh, we can start thinking about other ideas and so on. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this overview. Um, and then Rachel. Yes, so I'm gonna invite you, Dr. Semrad, don't go anywhere. Keep your screen on. Okay. And okay. Anna, if you wanna come back on the screen, we are going to do our first Q and A. Um, thank you everyone who's been putting questions in the feed. We will try to get to mm -hmm. as many of these as we can. Um, and so first I am going to start off by some of our um, first questions. I would love just to ask Anna, uh, what are your thoughts on the safety of wheat starch? Um, great question. So with wheat starch, um, when we really look at the whole grain, um, the whole grain has many different parts to it. Um, and so some parts include the starchy portion, which is the endosperm, um, the bran and the germ include like the protein, the vitamins and the fiber. 
And so what sweet starch is, um, it's that um, carbohydrate starchy part removed from the grain. Um, and so this can be done in a way that kind of just isolates it, but it's really hard to just isolate that starch and then not have any um, protein left over. Um, but it is possible to make it in a way that it is below 20 parts per million. So it really depends. Um, if you have a product that says wheat starch on it and it's not labeled gluten-free, um, I would say there's a chance that it, it might have higher than 20 parts per million. Um, if it's a product you love, you should reach out to the manufacturer to check out. Um, but if it is wheat starch and it is labeled gluten-free, and an example of that would be something like the Char products, which have the wheat starch in them, but they are all tested and are all below 20 parts per million. Um, and so that would be considered safe. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. And Dr. Semrad, I'm going to ask this question for you. Um, can you speak to oat sensitivity specifically and whether it's considered a part of celiac or a separate condition? Well, it's just like I showed you the, the figure that showed the activated T cell that was specific. That's a clone of cells that only reacts to the gluten peptides. It's a clone of cells that can form in celiac patients against that avenine protein in oats. So technically it's not celiac disease from the point of gluten activated T cell population, but there's an oat avenine activated and it can have the same damaging result to the intestine. By the way, this is very rare. I don't want people to run out and be scared of oats because oats are a very important part of the diet for palatability and variety. But a very small subset will react to it. It's not impossible. They, we just have to watch closely when oats are introduced to make sure those that little subset of people don't get into trouble. And then they can't eat oats just the way they can't eat gluten. And, I think and we could important. tolerate to oats, but we'd have to use a, use a oral tolerance model with the avenin protein to wipe out those T cells. Right. And I think I'd like to emphasize what Dr. Semrad is saying is that it's a small percentage of people in the, in the celiac world that will react to oats. Um, again, as Anna had mentioned, the gluten-free oats are important because of cross-contamination, et cetera. But oats as oats, a small percentage. So again, a follow-up, following up with your clinical team, looking at symptoms, looking at test results and so on would be important, but small percentage. And just can I make a statement about the wheat starch? So we know that in, in England, they used to have wheat starch 200 part per million in, in gluten-free food. And it's not so much if you eat a cracker or something, but if you eat a lot of 200 part per million food, then you exceed that threshold that it starts activating those, those memory lymphocytes. So again, they try to get wheat starch to this low, low level because it has something to do with how much of it you eat too. If you eat a lot of processed, if you only ate a little processed food, you could eat 200 part per million. But we want it to be where people can eat gluten-free things with fiber, everything in it that they can have sandwiches and pizzas and whatever they want that has, that's low enough so it doesn't trigger that threshold to activate the immune system. So it's a kind of a numbers game, if you will. Absolutely. And I think following up with this numbers game, there was a question about the 20 parts per million that is a threshold for disease. Um, so how does that relate to intestinal damage? So Dr. Semrad, I think you sort of started off with that, but maybe you can complete that thought. So yes, 20 parts per million is what we say, but what does that mean from yeah. an intestinal damage standpoint, right? I think what it means is they did these clinical old, you know, don't, Again, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Those old clinical studies from the 80s and the 90s, those will never be done again. But they took doses of gluten and exposed human intestine to those doses of gluten and came out with a threshold of 50 milligrams of gluten that would trigger inflammation 
above that in most people, but some people even 50 was too much. As I said, it's a sensitivity factor too. Some people are exquisitely sensitive. Then you turn that threshold of an absolute number into how many parts per million in a, in a gluten-free product can people consume so they don't reach that 50 milligram total protein amount that's going to trigger bowel inflammation. So it's kind of a, a calculation that goes into what threshold in food can you eat large amounts of it and, and yet not trigger your, your celiac disease? Because even 50, you could say 20 part per million, that's contamination, right? That doesn't have zero gluten. It has less than 20 part per million. So those numbers are meant to stay under that threshold of 50 milligrams, which was in the old clinical studies where they didn't see symptoms or bowel inflammation if you stay at that threshold or lower. Except if you ate that every day, um, then at some point you're going to end up with some inflammation. So again, it goes back to being careful without being too careful uh, <laughs> with looking at, um, yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah. I think that we have these sort of set expectations of 20 parts per million, um, and we need to take that. But again, going back to what Anna had said is looking at a healthy diet and not always looking at a processed kind of food diet, because that's right. where you'll get your right. 20 parts per million, 10 right. times a day. Right. Um, and I think this, you know, we have these new ways to look at um, what people are eating by looking in the urine and looking at stool samples, actually. And you know, when I put that slide up, up to 60% are, are eating too much gluten, that's based on these new studies to really break it down. And when they looked at people on a gluten-free diet to start, A, they still had some more bowel inflammation or more lymphocytes than they should have had. And B, there's gluten coming out in the urine and the stool, little peptides. So we know that uh, people are 20 part per million is still, as Dr. Verma said, it's not nothing. But the question is how sensitive is, how, how reactive is your immune system to even traces of gluten? And that's a broad spectrum in terms of symptoms and inflammation. So if you're, you don't have symptoms, but you have silent inflammation, that may not be good for your health either. So we're always trying to figure out what's the most important. And the answer is both symptoms and inflammation. Both we want to dampen down to normal. Right. There are so many questions, Dr. Verma, in this chat. I was hoping we could address at least one more. Absolutely. Um, and one, uh, why don't we start with you? And um, specifically, I, I believe, Carol, you were speaking to um, at-risk infants. And what does the research say in terms of when and how we introduce gluten to reduce the risk of celiac later in their lives? So I would love if all of you could kind of take a stab at that, but Dr. Verma, if you want to get started. Yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> I think, you know, a long time ago, uh, we would talk about you should introduce cereal only between this time and that time and kind of thing, uh, and that in the genetically susceptible patient. Um, studies, you know, big studies done through Europe did not really come up with that. So right now, um, you follow what your pediatrician tells you in terms of introduction of cereal. Um, so between that four to six months, really none of the studies have shown whether you do early cereal or late cereal is going to change anything. But as Dr. Semrad had mentioned in her slide, what is the highest sort of, um, if you want to call them alarm signals or highest prediction would be with the DQ2 female. I mean, those are things that um, you can't change. Uh, so those are things you cannot change. Now, if I say from a practical standpoint, what I usually will suggest if I am suggesting introducing cereal is I say start between four and six months as you would in any other child. And Again, this it may not be totally science, but what I do say is if your child is having an infection, like a cold or something like that, don't introduce the cereal at that time. Goes back again to some of the studies that have been done and Dr. Uh, Semrad showed them beautifully with Dr. Um, Jabri having done with the role of infection and um, autoimmunity and so on. So it's again, something that I advise my patients is you can introduce four to six months if you're genetically susceptible, 
if it's an infection or something like that, don't introduce it at that time. And don't start off with, you know, tablespoons at one time, start off gradually and then increase it over time. I mean, that's my advice to the patients. Clearly from a research standpoint, the timing does not matter. Um, Dr. Semrad, anything that you want to add? Yeah, I think there was one study that showed that if children uh, got these infections and were eating high amounts of gluten, so there is an issue of, of a lot of gluten coming in at a time where there's an infection or something vulnerable happening to make that lining more permeable, or the immune system is particularly active where it could somehow switch on that autoimmunity or reaction to gluten, it kind of gets caught in the process and then is viewed as foreign, just like the infection, uh, you know, it, but it's hard to say because even in the adult world, you know, one of the big mysteries of celiac disease is why is 80% of patients diagnosed in the adult life? They're not even diagnosed in, in infancy or when they start eating gluten. So why do they go along asymptomatic and then they get some sort of trigger like a bad infection? Oftentimes we'll hear, I went travel somewhere, I got a horrible viral, you know, everyone got sick on food and it never got better in me. My spouse, kids got better, I never got better. And then you, you say, oh, okay, you've got celiac disease now. So, so there's something that you're eating the gluten all along and something breaks that moment. And what is that moment and how can we prevent that in high risk people? So it's a high risk. The easiest place to prevent it is in the high risk children who we think are the ones who are going to have that happen in their life. But, you know, this is, and I think prevention to me, prevention and promoting tolerance is Beyond that, I think the gluten-free diet, I, for a few people will need those extra anti-inflammatory immune things and certainly traveling the oral enzymes. Yes, this can all be a positive for celiac patients for their lives, but I think the real money is in prevention and going back to promoting tolerance for the big picture. And we could do it in celiac disease. That, that's real. And, and not real 40 years from now. I think right. it's real now going forward. Well, I there are so many questions and perhaps if some of our speakers even wanna take a stab at answering them virtually, but otherwise we, you guys have given us so much thoughts for future topics. As Dr. Verma mentioned, we have family network events throughout the year um, where we address kind of tackle one one topic. We just did cross-contamination in January with Anna and Dr. Verma. And again, I think we have future topics, but I want to keep this program going. We have two other amazing topics to address. As Wait, we can, can I just say yes. one more thing, Rachel, because oh, yes. I'm looking in the chat room oh, and yes. I'm seeing a lot of the one thing I worry about when I see a lot of these questions is the fretting about, you know, can I eat a nut? Can I eat a seed? Can I? Okay, we have to, you know, we have to calm down the way we have to calm down in society in general about, about just too much information, too much minutia that gets in the way of enjoying life. So the bottom line is, if you have celiac, in the adult world, if you have celiac disease and you're on a gluten-free diet and your symptoms get better and your, and your antibodies go back to negative, and then I repeat your biopsy on a gluten-free diet, on your gluten-free diet and your intestine is normal, that's good enough. However you're eating is good enough. It's perfect, in fact, because what's better than a normal duodenum? That is the holy grail. So... I think we have to get away with trying to identify all these minutia places it could come in anywhere. It can, yes, it can come in anywhere. I'm not saying we don't have to be vigilant, but I think we need to, that's why we now in the adult world re-biopsy people. So we can say, you've been gluten-free for a year or two, we re you, you're normal, whatever you're doing, you're doing right. You don't have to be, you don't have to stop going to restaurants. You don't, you know, you're doing it as good, you know, you're back. The people we worry about is the people who can't quite get back there. And those are the people we try to get stricter and the quality of life goes down and, you know, it's, it's a hard life. There's no question about it. 
Agreed. But I don't think we should have hyper vigilance. Uh, and I think the vigilance is good enough, including not just for the adults, but what we do to our children as well. Um, so just quickly to answer from a rice standpoint, don't worry about it. Rice has been there and I will answer your question. Do not worry about that. Of course, you want to try and do many different grains from a health standpoint, but stop worrying about the arsenic. This rice has been the same rice forever. All of us have been eating. If you have anything that, you know, like grains and nuts and things like that, just wash them, wash and eat. And, you know, soap and water is your best friend in the gluten-free world. So wash and don't put soap on the rice, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but wash it. just wash water washing. That's it that you want to do. And that will help everyone. Hypervigilance is not good for anyone. Um, and I think that brings us to our next talk. Yes. with uh, our psychologist who will tell us on how to cope with this disease. Uh, the coping is what we all need to do. We've heard about the gluten-free diet. We've heard about cross-contamination, medications and all that. But our children and all of us are living in this world that has a lot of gluten around us. So how do we cope with it? How do we prevent that hypervigilance from happening? How do we keep ourselves safe mentally as well as the physical part that has been discussed. So Dr. Mertens is our psychologist and she's a pediatric psychologist, has been with the section of pediatric GI and um, is a tremendous help with our patients with any chronic disease. So I'm going to leave the floor to Dr. Mertens to educate us a little bit on how to cope. So Dr. Mertens, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. I am having a quick issue that I will resolve very, okay. very, <laughs> sorry, apologies. No worries. Um, just let us know if you need us to swing into different, ah, there you go, you're here. Okay, I think this is it. <laughs> I think we're good. Um, thank you, uh, thank you all so much. I'm so excited to, uh, to be here today uh, and to uh, um, be a part of the, our talk this morning. Um, uh, and thank you also to all the families who uh, have uh, joined us today. Um, so I am, I'm a pediatric psychologist who uh, works with a, a number of interdisciplinary clinics. And my role is to help with the coping aspect of, uh, um, of chronic illness, including celiac disease. So some of my goals for, for this portion, some of our goals for this portion includes discussing some of the psychosocial impacts of celiac disease on children and families. And um, by psychosocial, what I'm referring to are the ways that celiac disease can affect the psychological uh, and mental, uh, psychological or emotional and mental health, which is where we get that psych part, uh, as well as the ways that celiac disease can affect how we relate to others, which is that social part. Um, but we're going to spend most of our time today talking about the strategies for managing these impacts so that children and families can cope, live, and most importantly, thrive with celiac disease. And so I want to start with just a quick note on prevalence. So there are about 21 million people in the U.S. that have either celiac disease or non-gluten, uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is about 3 million people uh, or 1% of the U.S. population with celiac disease and 18 million people are about 6 percent of the uh, population with NCGS. And so I mentioned these statistics because it's important for families and kiddos to know that you're not alone. Um, there are a number of people who are also coping with similar concerns and, and uh, that means that we have a lot of resources available to, to help. Um, and so it's also important to note that children with uh, celiac disease and the families coping with the disease can live very happy and fulfilling lives. And there's a ton of resources out there, including toolkits and information packets, blogs, online support groups, recipes, and, and more to help children and families tackle the unique challenges of celiac disease. Um, and so just a few of my favorites are like Beyond Celiac, Raising Our Celiac Kids or, or ROC, uh, the National Celiac Association, and of course, uh, the Celiac Disease Foundation. Um, and I can include these in the chat. They'll also be in um, uh, the slides if they're, uh, if they're shared later on. This is not, of course, to suggest that living with celiac disease is easy. And this definitely should not suggest that you're doing something wrong if you're finding it difficult to manage your or your child's celiac disease. Because treating celiac disease, which ideally involves a strict adherence to a gluten-free diet, requires a lot of changes to the family routine and to family rituals. 
And so as a result, celiac affects all members of the family system, including of course the child and other family members who are diagnosed with celiac disease, as well as the parents and caregivers who often report disease-related worry, guilt, restricted freedom in meals and challenges in managing daily life. And of course the siblings who might experience a number of challenging emotions like feeling a need to protect their sibling or um, having fears about catching celiac disease or feeling that they may have caused their, caused their sibling celiac disease in some way, as well as the psychosocial social stressors that impact the system as a whole. Um, and some of these psychosocial concerns include the stress that comes with the day-to-day -day management of a chronic condition, like managing different restrictions on diets and activities and making sure that um, I have the uh, spare meals or things uh, that I need to navigate a social, a social interaction, facing different challenges that may come up, remembering doctor's appointments, or just feeling kind of crummy on the day-to-day. Other concerns might include social isolation and feeling different from friends, family members, and other families, um, or figuring out how to talk to friends, families, teachers, and other caregivers about celiac disease, what it is and what it isn't, and how it might affect you or your child and everything that goes into uh, keeping ourselves healthy. And this at times includes navigating for yourself um, or for your child when others just don't really get it. They don't really understand what... Um, what every, why we do the things that we do, why we're maintaining a gluten-free diet. Um, other concerns might, might include figuring out how to navigate school and other social events like birthday parties or proms, um, or figuring out the day-to-day -day, day -day family routines like mealtimes and the occasional mistake or setback. And these, of course, are just a few of the concerns that families can have, because the truth is that managing a chronic health condition is not easy. Um, but there are things that kids and families can do to help ease the, ease the burden. And families play a really, really big role in tackling the challenges of celiac disease. And I want to spend some time talking a bit about uh, the ways that families can help. First, I want to talk about the power of knowledge. And what I mean by that is learning as much as you can about celiac disease, but not so much that we are, uh, like we were mentioning before, so much so that we're feeling overburdened and overwhelmed by information. Um, I think it's worth noting that being here today, though, is already a huge step towards promoting this positive and healthy coping approach because having information about your symptoms, various treatment options, gluten diets, and what to expect during different medical visits can be so empowering. Uh, knowing what to do to manage your symptoms promotes healthy coping and uh, a sense of control in children and families, and it promotes um, positive co communication between kids and their caregivers. Um, and all of this together empowers families to communicate concerns to their medical team. Um, for, kids and for kids and teens, parents are often the most important source of information and they can bridge the uh, information gap between medical visits and checkups. So it's really important to, uh, for parents to continually get a sense of what your child understands about celiac disease by asking, uh, asking um, questions and listening to their uh, listening to their questions and filling in gaps when, um, when it's needed. Um, these, uh, these discussions should be developmentally and age appropriate, meaning that uh, these discussions should kind of in a way grow up with your child. For very, very young kids, ex simple explanations like that food is going to make your belly hurt or it's going to make your brain foggy. Um, is best and it's less scary than using words like contamination and inflammation whereas older kids and teens really would benefit from having more complex discussions about celiac disease. Um, unfortunately, it's really not uncommon for these types of discussions to begin and end at the time of diagnosis, which for many that time can be, um, it can be a time of like really big and really conflicting emotions, like having relief for finally having a name for all these symptoms, but also having worries about what this might mean for the future. And so as adults, it's very easy to assume that kids have the same level of information that we do. Like we're both there receiving the information at the same time. Um, but kids process information differently across the developmental, uh, their developmental lifespan and where they're at in their development can have a big impact on, on the information that they're really absorbing. So it's important to keep lines of communication open and to continue to have these discussions um, over and over again, with a good rule of thumb being to check in on what your child know, excuse me, what your child knows and uh, correct any misperceptions your child may have on at least a yearly, a yearly basis. 
um, having these lines of communication open and having these discussions regularly sets the stage for tackling a number of the issues and challenges that may come up, like helping children feel with feeling different than others. Um, and to help with this, really communication between kids and families is key. I cannot understate how important uh, communication is. For um, much younger kids, we try to keep these discussions practical and informational, like, no, you can't have that food or, or that Play-Doh, uh, but here's what, you, here's what you can have, and kind of refocusing back on what, we are, um, what they are able to have. Um, at this stage, it's also really helpful to just start reading labels together, even before a child is like fully able to, to read, just to set the, food for, uh, set the stage for what foods are okay and what foods um, we should avoid and normalize in practicing reading those labels. Um, in truth, children don't really no start to notice differences until they're around the ages of three to five, but this may not be associated with the same type of emotional meaning that parents might expect or worry about. Um, instead, these observations are usually things like, oh, my hair is a little different than theirs, or, oh, they eat different foods than me. Um, so again, it's important to listen to exactly what your child is saying, validate their observation, like, you're right, you are eating a different food, and then refocus back on what they can have and, their, and what their strengths are. As kids get a little older um, and into their teen years, most kids start to notice their differences from others in a much more a valuative way. While, but, the, but while the conversations tend to take a more mature and complex tone, the ways that we address these concerns for our older teens is a lot like how we would address them for younger kids. Uh, and we do this by listening reflectively to what they're saying and reflecting their concerns back to them. For example, I hear that you are upset because there weren't really any safe food options for you at the football game. Offering empathy by validating how frustrated, frustrated they might feel sometimes and even sharing how you're feeling when it's appropriate too. Like, I understand you're feeling frustrated. I feel frustrated too. Um, but then refocusing back on to their core strengths and the things that make them similar to other kids. Like, yeah, you can't really have uh, types of foods that are at the, the bowling alley with your friend, but let's focus back on the social aspects. Like what are the fun things you can do with your friends? Older uh, children and teens also play a bigger role in their coping. Um, on their own. Uh, so some tips for the things that parents can encourage teens to do is to uh, refocus back on the things that you can do instead of the things that you can't. Um, it is completely normal to feel bummed out about the things you're not able to do. You're allowed to have that feeling, but also try to find at least two things that you are able to do for each thing that you can't. Um, this is a good strategy because it helps us get into the habit of celebrating our strengths and being proud of the things that um, that you're good at and knowing that this can and it should look a lot different than what other people's strengths look like. For these, um, for social interactions, try to think of non-food activities that you can do with your friends, like play in a sport or going to a mu museum or an escape room. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to think of things or deal with problems with other kids by yourself. So know who you can ask for help and be sure to remember that you can always ask a close friend, parent, or another adult for help if things do get tough. Uh, and don't underestimate the power of connecting with other people your age who have similar experiences as you. So online communities, social media pages, or support groups can really be super valuable. And there's so many awesome online um, communities where teens can connect with other teens and parents can connect with other parents or watch videos about how, how other kids and uh, families have coped with celiac disease. Talking to others about celiac disease can also help kids and teens cope with feeling different um, because if your friends understand how you're feeling and what your needs are, it makes it a lot easier to advocate for your needs. One way that adults can model this for kids is to start practicing an elevator pitch from an early age. Having a sort of um, a script to talk about celiac disease can really help empower kids to advocate for their health uh, and their needs and um, different social situations. So the, uh, a good basis for this script could uh, start with something like, I have celiac disease and it can be serious. And then going forward, adding things like, I usually can't share food that other people make or bring, but I can insert something that works for, uh, for the child. Like I can share what I brought or, but I can eat some packaged foods or, but I can have fruits and vegetables. And then lastly, following up with uh, what might happen if I'm exposed. 
This last one can be a little tricky because sometimes kids may feel uncomfortable sharing their symptoms and sharing certain symptoms may also make others feel a little bit uncomfortable in certain contexts. So we only encourage kids to share what feels comfortable or necessary. If I'm exposed, I'm not gonna feel well. If I'm exposed, I could get really sick or if I'm exposed, here are the specific symptoms I, I may experience. For, uh, for older kids and teens who feel comfortable turning down offers to share foods, often something as simple as, I'm really allergic to gluten is often good enough ex explanation for most people. Even though celiac disease is not a food allergy, often that's usually sufficient when we're explaining to other people or just you know want to move on with our day. Um, just like communicating within families, it's important to revisit this pitch over time so that way uh, it will continue to grow and develop child's knowledge and uh, comfort level increases. Talking to other adults, including parents and caregivers, is also important for families to gain access to uh, supports and to set the framework for advocating for your child's safety. Um, so parents do play a really big role in making sure that there are academic accommodations in place at school, um, which I know Anna will tell us a bit more about in just a moment. Um, parents should also provide necessary information to all possible caregivers, including coaches, music instructors, instructors, and other parents. And there are a number of uh, really helpful handouts that um, you can use to facilitate this instead of creating your own. Um, I personally like there's a one page um, teacher letter, uh, letter that NCA and Rock provides uh, for free online. Um, for other caregivers who spend a lot of time with your child, inviting them to attend medical appointments whenever possible so that way they can uh, address any questions or concerns that, that come up themselves. Um, and throughout all of these discussions, when communicating about your child's health needs, especially in front of your child, practice saying things like, thank you, instead of sorry. Um, thank you for helping us keep my child safe and healthy instead of apologizing for your health's needs. Um, depending, uh, de um, sorry, apologizing for your child's health needs. Um, depending on your social comfort level, it is very easy to get in the habit of apologizing, especially if you feel worried about um, maybe coming across as demanding or needy or worry about what uh, perceptions others may have about gluten-free diets. Um, but kids look to parents as examples for how to cope. Saying sorry communicates that their health needs are shameful or that they're a burden on others, and it could actually accidentally get in the way of them advocating for themselves when you're not there. So saying thank you instead allows you to express that appreciation without accidentally communicating that their needs um, should be a problem for other people. And as parents, we can also promote our child's resiliency by anticipating and preparing for challenge, challenges. This includes things like um, providing developmentally appropriate warnings and explanations about medical tests before the day of the procedure, um, setting the stage for navigating social events by um, uh, preparing ahead of time, um, having a meal ahead of the event, bringing safe foods to the events, or um, calling restaurants or visiting restaurants in, persons, in person before arriving to make sure that they can accommodate your child's needs. Um, with restaurants, many families find it helpful to keep allergy cards in their wallet or their bags to make it easier to share uh, information about restricted diets to the staff. Um, and NCA also has a really great restricted diet card that you can print for free um, that I can, I can share as well. Um, and we want to, uh, across situations, encourage, encourage resiliency in response to challenges. Um, we want to reduce opportunities for avoiding challenges. And so if something feels challenging or scary, let's find ways that we can still do the thing that feels scary. Um, if we uh, uh, allow avoidance or promote avoidance, then it can accidentally teach kids that they're not able to cope in these situations. Instead, we wanna be able to build that resiliency in those situations. Um, and uh, uh, this, a lot, teaching kids how to face difficulties when they arise um, is a really great way of promoting healthy coping. Um, other opportunities for building resiliency include uh, maintaining family routines, sticking to those regular routines that we had prior to diagnosis. Um, for example, uh, a lot of times families may um, start to have meals totally separately to avoid frustration or discomfort, but this can actually um, increase that feelings of those feelings of anxiety, increase the feeling of being different from others. Um, so instead, we maintain these normal routines to allow kids to gain confidence and comfort to face these social situations, like the ones that they, they will face when they're inevitably um, uh, eating out on their own, like at school. 
Um, another example uh, includes um, like trips. If you always went on a trip every summer prior to diagnosis, try to maintain this tradition when possible. Um, and then another, you know, speaking of routines and um, uh, problem concerns, it's also super common for parents to experience some discomfort when it comes to disciplining a child with chronic illness, but kids do really thrive on the structure, predictability, and the routine, particularly when they're struggling with the uncertainty um, associated to, with coping with a chronic illness. So it's super important for families to stick to those disciplinary routines when possible. Uh, a really good routine or strategy that I like is to ignore those minor misbehavior, minor behavior problems as much as possible, and then praise, uh, offer verbal reinforcement and incentives to increase positive behaviors or the behaviors you would like to um, see happen more often. Um, so in terms of medical management, uh, I think with younger kids, they often require more support and oversight. One way to help them um, stick with uh, their routines or stick with a gluten-free diet is to provide um, younger children's, children with choices as much as possible and to involve them in care decisions whenever possible. Um, we also want to be mindful of preparing young teens for independent self-management. So that preparation actually starts as early as possible, even in, when they're very, very young. And that's where things like reading, um, reading labels together or involving them in healthcare decisions can really be helpful. Um, so as I mentioned before, every member of the family system can be impacted by celiac disease, including siblings. Um, so we can help siblings cope with uh, some of the challenges that may come up by making sure that they have, they also have an understanding of the disease, um, asking questions and correcting misperceptions and involving them in the management of celiac disease. Some families find it helpful to involve siblings in some of the doctor's appointments if possible. Um, and to um, overall, just making sure that we're scheduling extra time and attention for siblings so that way they're also getting their support needs met. Um, and I just have uh, just a couple more things I wanted to mention. One of the most important things is um, to not forget that parents can cope too. Um, it's actually really important for, uh, for all members of the family that parents utilize adaptive coping and self-care. Um, so as I mentioned before, kids do look to parents to learn how to cope. And the best way to teach children how to cope with challenges is to model the type of coping you yourself would want for them to use. This can include things like seeking out social supports. Social support is super, super, super important. Um, this can include things like just talking with family and friends or actually seeking out organized um, social support programs. Um, and of course, remember to take time for yourself or engage in self-care. Do things that you enjoy that are just for you. This can include things as, as simple as like, taking a walk, exercising, reading, or just taking a warm shower or bath, um, or even something more involved like taking a class or joining a club. And if you're thinking like, okay, great idea lady, but um, that is not happening, you are absolutely not alone. Um, most of the parents I've spoken to tell me that self-care is really hard to do either because of feelings of guilt or feeling like I'm being selfish for taking time for myself or worries about leaving my child with another caregiver. Um, and those feelings are very valid, but also at, and at the same time, taking even 10 minutes a day for yourself is so important to help you recharge and be present for your child and your family. Um, it's the same idea as when you're on a plane, putting your oxygen mask on before you help other people with, their, with theirs. Um, and, the, and the last thing is to remember to foster your relationship with your significant other. Um, if another parent or parents are part of your family system, um, set aside time to spend time together when possible, communicate openly about concerns or problems as they arise, and work together to establish a collaborative game plan for tackling challenges. And lastly, of course, problems can arise, um, especially in the times that we're working to give teens more responsibility and independence. It might sound like it should be easier, but adhering to a strict diet every single day can be hard and mistakes will happen. Kids sometimes do things they're not supposed to do. And sometimes, believe it or not, parents are also allowed to make mistakes because we're human and everyone makes mistakes. Um, the good news is that by maintaining that open communication and problem solving uh, and building resiliency, we're already at such a good spot to work together to navigate problems when they arise. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, stuff happens and it's normal to feel guilty when it does. 
Guilt doesn't feel great, um, but it is a good protective emotion to have because it keeps us on track and helps us make better choices in the future. But there's also, as we know, the possibility to have too much of a good thing and guilt is only as helpful as it motivates us to change behavior in the future. If we're experiencing too much guilt or guilt is getting in the way of other stuff, it could be a sign that we might need more help. Um, and of course it is normal to feel sad, anxious or frustrated some of the times, but when feelings stop us from doing things um, that we need to do or uh, that we like to do, it might be time to seek additional support. Um, and if you have concerns or about feelings that are getting in the way of doing the things you like or need to do, you can talk with your care team that will help you connect with a psychologist or another mental health professional who can help. Uh, and these providers can offer strategies for managing stress, like relaxation strategies or problem solving. And uh, other ways to find a therapist include calling your insurance or going on websites like Psychology Today, uh, for example. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your time. And I will look forward to seeing you again in just a minute for our Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Mertens. Um, really a very nice overview. I loved it when you said, um, thank you and not sorry. I need to remember <laughs> that. And I would say, perhaps it's never a mistake, but it's a learning experience. So I think all the blunders we make are learning experiences. So thank you so much for helping us with this and we'll move along. Uh, and then we'll join you later in a few minutes for the Q&A. Um, so keep the questions coming in Q&A. Um, and right now we'll move on to Anna telling us a little bit about celiac disease and 504 plans and how we actually help our patients here at the University of Chicago as well. Anna? Hey everyone, so thanks for having me back up. Um, so we just wanna discuss um, celiac disease in learning environments. Um, so kids spend so much time um, during the week at school um, and then after school activities, camps, trips, et cetera, um, and having an agreed upon plan for meals and then other accommodations is just something important to consider. Um, so what we're going to kind of go through is we'll briefly talk about where gluten can be found um, in learning environments, what support systems are in place currently, like available for you to use, um, and then the laws that really back those systems up in school. Um, we'll also touch on actually implementing a 504 plan and some consideration and resources for you. Okay, so gluten and learning um, environments. Really... Um, Part of um, the support we want to offer in learning environments is um, where kids spend majority of their time during the week. Um, when we think of learning environments, the first thing that pops into our head and that we assume is the classroom, and that's correct, of course. Um, however, the support system um, really should extend to all areas where kids um, spend time learning. Um, and so that can be formally and informally, um, meaning field trips, playgrounds, um, daycares, and sports fields all count. Um, so where is gluten in school? Um, the first thing that pops into our head is the lunchroom, which that's correct as well, um, because that's where the food is. Um, but that's definitely, um, there's more to it for like risk of cross contact and gluten exposures through like classroom celebrations, gluten containing materials such as Play-Doh, um, or even like cool science projects like um, moldy bread experiment. Um, so now when there are no appropriate substitutions um, for these kind of social activities, um, exclusion and isolation may arise um, leading to um, really a hard time at school. And then in addition, some kids um, may experience like physical symptoms of celiac disease, um, which may be um, embarrassing and painful and anxiety inducing, um, like just mentioned. Um, and then all these feelings can prevent um, the actual um, learning and being able to focus in class. Okay, so um, there are a few different plans available in school, and it's really important to understand the difference between them um, to see why 504 is the best one for celiac. So the 504 plan um, is a legally binding agreement um, between the parents and the school. Um, and so what's really special about it is that 504 plan covers um, 
areas outside of the academic setting. Um, so like it will cover the um, the class, the lunchroom, but also like all those after school activities, um, whether sports or going on a trip somewhere, um, anything that's sponsored by the school, but like off site. Um, and so most notably the 504 plan, um, it really does not account for academic performance. So this is the best plan for kids with celiac um, as it is it really covered, it covers an array of situations. Um, and it also offers um, accommodations regardless of academic progress. Um, then next we have the individualized education plan. And this one is really geared towards um, disability around kids' academic performance. Um, so this would be something like ADHD, um, dyslexia, or many, or many others. Um, and so the other plan, the last one, is the individualized health um, healthcare plan, um, which covers medical issues in school. Um, and so by first looking at it, we might think, oh, well, celiac disease is a medical um, condition. So it probably goes well with this. Um, however, it is not legally enforceable um, and it does not really account for cafeteria or classroom situations. So ultimately it, it's just um, a plan that becomes a document that shows that the nurse um, offered the minimum care the child needs. Okay, so there are different laws um, in place which kind of help support those plans that are in school. Um, so the first being the Section 504 of the Rehab Rehabilitation Act of 1973, um, which prevents discrimination um, on the basis of a disability in any institution that is receiving financial assistance. Um, so this allows for accommodations to um, to students that result um, in meeting individual educational needs without drastically changing like the structure of the educational system. Um, and then the next thing we have the Americans with the Disability Act of 1990. Um, and this one really defines what a disability is, um, which it is something like a physical or mental impairment that limits um, a, life, a major life function and eating as a huge life function. Um, and this is why celiac disease is covered underneath that. Um, the National School Lunch Program offers reduced or free um, lunches to students who qualify for them. Um, because the gluten-free meals can be expensive, um, this is an option which would include gluten-free meals um, to qualified students. And then lastly, we have the Child um, Nutrition Act, which is an overall extension of the um, National School Lunch Program. Um, so it kind of covers things like it includes breakfast, um, special milk program, um, and it most importantly establishes USDA's nutrient guidelines um, for those meals that are provided to, to kids in school. Um, so that just means that when a gluten-free free meal is um, offered at school, it needs to be a hot for hot meal and it needs to include the same nutrients. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing like pizza for gluten free pizza, but it has to have the same nutrients and also be a warm meal. Okay, so knowing that 504 is the best option for celiac disease, um, we do want to um, kind of go through what the steps are to put one in place. There are four general steps that you'd want to take. Um, first is getting a diagnosis letter from your doctor, which confirms the diagnosis of celiac disease. Um, this letter would often be delivered to a nurse who would then set up the 504 meeting. Um, so be prepared for this meeting. Um, it is something that um, will go into detail and you want to make sure you kind of cover everything that your child may need. Um, and so one of the ways to prepare it is by reading the 2020 volunteer recommendations for managing celiac disease and learning environments, um, which um, just covers all the information we went through in greater detail. Um, it does have a diagnosis letter example in there and an actual 504 plan example as well. Um, in addition to many amazing resources like classroom substitutions for projects and so on. Um, 
A complementary resource that is available is through Celiac Disease Foundation. Um, it's a 504 training program, um, and it's meant for educators, food service um, staff, and also parents and guardians. Um, so it kind of teaches those three different groups about the 504, what it should include, and training um, that pertains directly to those individuals. Um, and then once you know the plan you have come up with the plan, um, all the parties sign, um, and then you just revisit yearly to make sure um, you add or change anything that needs to be. Okay, so when you actually um, come up with the plan, although there are different templates out there that you can use, um, it's really important to consider your child's individual needs for the plan. Um, and so this would be things like their specific school curriculum um, and even just your child's wants because some kids might care more about certain things than others. Um, and it's really important to include them in this conversation. Um, so in class, you need to think about what is going on in our class, um, what supplies are they using, um, what may have gluten in them, like Play-Doh, um, collages, paper mache. Um, in younger grades, sensory tables may be a thing, so like pasta is very often used for those. Um, and then in older grades, science classes um, will use... Um, you know, different art projects um, that may also include um, gluten containing foods and like home economic classes as well. So um, is there any risk of cross contact for any portion of the meal, for example, for the cafeteria portion? Um, you know, that's another consideration. Um, if the gluten-free meal is offered, you want to think about how it's prepared. Um, and if there are any gluten-free foods available, where are those stored? If it's like a salad bar um, and it's among other foods that do have gluten in them and, you know, you can easily swap um, the utensils, that would be something to uh, think about and consider. Okay, um, and so the resources, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry, other things to consider um, would be um, laws, really using those laws to uh, make reasonable accommodations. So making sure that gluten-free meals um, provided by the school is a hot for hot meal. Um, and it also has the same nutritional content. Um, so just looking into that. And you want to make sure that the plan really accounts for um, situations in your in which your child might be at risk um, for cross contact and then getting sick and how you would respond to a situation like that for like a potential exposure or um, cross contact or ingestion. Um, you also want to make sure that you have a clear line of communication who should be contacted in such cases. Um, and then, of course, having the ability to um, like wash their hands before meals and having extra time for bath bathroom breaks, um, or being able to do nurses visits as needed. Okay, so lastly, um, there are many resources available um, for you. Um, to put to kind of put this plan in place, as already mentioned, we have the voluntary um, recommendations developed by 46 experts in celiac disease um, who kind of came up with a consensus on how to do this in school. Um, the Celiac Disease Foundation offers the training program, um, and then our Celiac Center will actually be hosting um, a family network event on a specific topic April 5th. So we do hope you can join us for that as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anna. And I know that Anna is going to head on over to our breakout session. And um, I want to, if we can, still have Elena and Dr. Verma as part as, of our Q&A um, that we will continue right before we pause for a moment. But again,